All right, so we're going to be in verses 26 to 40, where we're looking at the touch of God. And our theme is this this morning, is that the Spirit of God compels us to share with compassion. The Spirit of God compels us to share with compassion. Now, it's, it's imperative that in the times and the moments that we share the good news of Jesus Christ, that we realize that without it being given to us, we would be in the same place as them. So it's not that we're better because we have the Spirit, it's just that we've been changed because of the Spirit. And so that's what should lead us to share and to share the good news of Jesus Christ with those around us. It is vital. It is important. And it's one of the greatest privileges that we've been given because of what Jesus did on that cross for us. But if you remember back to Acts chapter 6, we got a, just a brief little a picture of these deacons that were mentioned in the, in the church, early church there. And, and we read about a man by the name of Philip, and, and his ministry was, uh, was a lead deacon. And so with this, him being a lead deacon, well, we never would have imagined that his ministry peaked just two chapters later. But a lot transpired between chapter 6 and chapter 8. His ministry grew exponentially amidst the persecution that was going on when, uh, as it was growing. And, and he, was, you know, he wasn't a pro at this point. He had, he had just been changed by the Holy Spirit himself. And, and now he's being called to be one of these apostles and these leaders um, as a deacon. Deacon meaning diaconal. It means that we're, he's going out and he's doing the work that God's called him to do. And he's doing it with a joyful heart and a willingness to serve other people. That's what a deacon is. Right? And so here he is, he he's, has this picture of what his God has called him to do. And so God took Philip specifically to go to a group um, outside of the Jerusalem, and he called him to go to the Samaritans. The Samaritans. And so the Samaritans are known as these people that are shunned by the Jewish culture. And so here he is, he's, he is a Jew, and he's being called to share with those that he's not accustomed to. All right, It's kind of like a guy from Georgia coming... To Pennsylvania. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, but the, well, not not really that far off, right? It, it's this idea that no matter where we have come down, the heritage and, and there's no hate here, as there was in the Jew and Samaritans, but uh, maybe sport team hate. But we won't go there. Um, go Bulldogs. Um, so we have this picture of, of of these Samaritans and and what took place when Philip was willing to do this. Philip was willing to, to be used by the Spirit to share with these Samaritans where other people weren't willing to go and weren't willing to do. And so as he's doing this, this his ministry had just exploded. And, and we see here in the second half of chapter 8, we see the transforming touch of God come through Philip in, in, in the middle of the desert of all pl places. You know, this is a guy who's done a lot of street and city ministry, whether it be in Jerusalem or whether it be in the middle of Samar the Samaritan people. And he's seen all kinds of large groups of people come to know Christ. And so he, he was willing to be used and to share the value uh, of what Jesus has done in his life. And so each of us, uh, like Philip, are called to bear the t gracious touch of God to others. And that's why we've entitled this morning, The Touch of God. So the first thing as we walk through chapter, uh, the second half of chapter 8, we see in verses 26 to 29, we see the touch of the Spirit. And so it's important for us to recognize the touch of the Spirit. We see in chapter 6 that Peter was this man who was filled with the Spirit. And what does that mean? Well, being filled with the Spirit means that he showed those characteristics that are mentioned in Galatians chapter 5 of be, that are called the fruits of the Spirit. Many of you might have heard of them, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He was a man who showed those things. So that's a, a man who's known as a man that is a full of the Spirit. And so when the touch of the Holy Spirit comes upon this Philip, Philip is willing to be led by the Spirit. And so as he's willing to be led, he's, he's willing and he's sensitive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit as he is, is following this as being a major factor of why he's willing to be used in someone else's life. So that, that's crucial. That's key, especially for us. That we, we have to be willing and open to following the Spirit's lead. And when we are, we will be used. It's not a we possibly will. It's a promise you will be. Because what's God's desire? 
above all things. He wants to use us to make his name known and for him to receive all the honor and glory. And he will be made known when we are willing, right? And we see this through Philip. And I, I love this picture. This is one of my favorite stories in the New Testament as we're walking through this. I don't have many favorites. Um, all right, that's a lie. You all know that. All right. Um, but we can assume here that, that God was willing to be used and, and, and willing to use this man. And, and it's, it doesn't matter how, right, in, in this picture of how. So what's Philip used to? Well, Philip's a Jew, and so he was used to being a Jew in Jerusalem, right? Then God called him out of Jerusalem and called him into the, to the Samaritans, right, to share with the Samaritans. So, he, so now he's, okay, I'm, I'm willing to go there. I'll be used by this. Now, now what's he willing to do? Well, I can tell you this, that is, if we are one that are looking to God to use us in a very specific and certain way, and if we're looking for God to use us in a certain way, I can promise you he's probably going to use you differently than that very certain way that you're only looking. And at the moment that we think that we might understand what the Spirit is doing and figuring him out, I can promise you, you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. Philip had enough spiritual understanding uh, not to resist the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So let's look here in, in verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said, uh, now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. So how is, how is he willing to be used? He's willing to be used no matter what. But he says, all of a sudden an angel appeared and said, All right, I want you to go to Gaza. Okay, so Philip, Philip's looking and seeing, okay, what, what is this angel? What is this all about? Well, we read in, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, it says this. It says that are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So what's that picture give us? What's an angel's job? What is an angel going to do? It's going to serve the ultimate goal of what God's called them to do and to be a part with teaching us. Philip was willing to be used no matter how God wanted it. And when he was willing to do it, he now sees this angel telling him what to do. All right. So this is pretty cool how God chooses to do that. Verse 27 says this. So he started out on, on his way and met the Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the, the cadence, right? This, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. All right, so again, now is the angel telling him to go to Gaza. Now the angel is saying, now he's in Gaza. Now he wants, all right, now I want you to see that See that chariot? I want you to follow it closely. So when the, when the touch of the Holy Spirit is, is, comes upon us, we need to be sensitive to that guidance. Now you might be thinking, now look, I have never had an angel stand in front of me and tell me to go somewhere. And I would say, how do you know? How do you know? Maybe God has, and you just don't know it. I can tell you that God likes to use his people that are willing to be used. So how much the, the voice of God coming through someone who is submissive to him and wants to be used by him and is willing to be used and shares with you, hey, I think God wants you to do this. Maybe we'll go to and then fill in the blank. The thing it is, uh, the picture that we're looking to, no matter whether it be difficulties, whether it be through an inner, an inner voice, whether it be through even angels, no matter what Peter or Philip himself knew that the voice of the Spirit was well, and it was causing him and, and calling him not to, be, not to be so stringent, not to think of him only working in a certain way, but he calls him to be flexible. Ooh, that one, that one. That kind of hits home. I don't know about you, but God called us to be flexible, to be willing to be used anyway, not just the way that you're comfortable with. I think if, if it's in our comfort zone, God might not call us to do it. Because then where is he in the midst of the comfort? All right, so here's this picture of, of supreme obedience that we see 
in Philip. Here he is, and he's willing to be used by the Holy Spirit in any way. Now, again, put yourself in Philip's perspective, right? So is he part of the 12 disciples that walked and followed Jesus? No. Is he part of the big three of the disciples that were truly loved by, by Jesus himself? No. We're reading, uh, uh, was, he, was he at this place in the Samaria that, that he was known and loved and people were following him like crazy because they thought that every word he said was God's truth? Yeah, that would be a pretty comfortable position to be in. He was in the Samaria and here he is sharing with all these people and everything he said they paid attention to and they were following and he saw big revival happening all over. And then God calls him to go to Gaza. He says, I want you to go to the middle of the desert. Huh? But you're doing awesome work over here. Why do you want me to go over there? Philip didn't do a lot of questioning. You know why? He wasn't an American. He didn't have to know everything before he went and did it. He was willing to be used by God, and he followed. Philip's one of the greatest forms of supreme obedience you'll find in Scripture because what happens as he follows this? Verse 30, it says that he ran. He didn't mope. He didn't say, oh, I had it so good in the Samaria. Why? No, he's like, let's go. I got this. Whatever you say, God, I'm willing to do it. This example is immaculate when it comes to the following the Holy Spirit. He was in touch with the Spirit that was willing to lead him. Why did God use Philip? Are there, are there others that, that could do the job better? I don't think so. I think Philip was like the ideal guy to go and to follow this guy in Gaza. But perhaps his spirit of obedience was what made him so unique. The text presents these two perspectives on the Ethiopian's eunuch, which was coming to Jesus, right? So from above, we read and see that the sovereign God is working in the heart of this man in such a way that it's causing him to have a pilgrimage to Jerusalem from Ethiopia, right? And this guy's hungry for God. This guy is is craving with what Jesus has to offer. And so as he's reading this scroll, he's he's taking him across the desert in a chariot, and he encounters this spirit-driven man who is an ambassador for Christ, Philip, and Philip leads him to Jesus. We often think about the perspective of it from Philip, but have you ever thought it from the perspective of the eunuch who is craving Jesus? And is following this leading in his heart. And all of a sudden, the eunuch, there's this man who appears out of nowhere. And is running after his chariot, saying, do you understand with what you're reading? Spoiler alert, that's what happens next. Think about this, being in touch with the Spirit. God chooses to use human obedience to carry out his plan. One writer put it this way, that God's sovereign work plus man's obedience brings the touch of God to needy human lives. There are all kinds of chance meetings ready to take place in a life that is sensitive and obedient to the Lord's leading. Divine appointments await us if we are obedient to the Lord's leading. This was Philip's experience, being in touch with the Spirit. The second thing we see here is being in touch with the gospel in verses 30 to 38. Now imagine as as Philip's heart left, as he saw this Ethiopian entourage in the middle of the desert. God calls him to go to Gaza. He's standing there in the middle of the desert and all of a sudden comes this train of people from Ethiopia on their way to Jerusalem. And so he's thinking, all right, what's in the middle of the desert that you've called me to? And he sees this giant group of people coming. Now, we often think of it just being like a chariot and a man and a guy driving him, like a taxi. No. This guy was big stuff. 
And he had all kinds of people with him. He had all kinds of a following with him. There were multiple people that were following this Ethiopian eunuch who was head of the treasury of Ethiopia. It's like you don't see, you don't see the big higher ups just by themselves walking the streets of DC, right? No, there's an entourage, people following them, right? So here we are, we're in the middle of this, this eunuch is a, is a black man, so therefore he's a Gentile, he's from Ethiopia, and he's completed a thousand mile religious pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and he's trying to figure out what this is that he is being a part of. Eventually, while this Ethiopian was under the influence of Judaism, he's gone to Jerusalem to either become a believer or help others on their journey. So they've been called to multiple things. He was a nobleman in search of of great need. And here he is traveling along among his chariot, reading out loud Isaiah chapter 53. Now, if you want to know something interesting about Isaiah 53, there is probably no greater passage in the Old Testament that talks of Jesus than Isaiah 53. As he's traveling in the midst of the desert, suddenly there stands Philip, God's hitchhiker. And Philip is there, so in touch with the Spirit and so in touch with God's Word and the Gospel that everything that followed was natural to Philip. Verse 29, the Spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and asked the man reading Isaiah the prophet, Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and to sit with him. This is the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he came deprived of justice. How, who can speak of this, of his descendants? For his life has taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet speaking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip to began, the very, began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news of Jesus. When we get to this final phrase in verse 35, we see perhaps there's no greater place in the Old Testament that speaks of Jesus. And there's no doubt that Philip took the man all the way to verse 12, describing the royal lineage describing the incarnation, describing the atonement. Then comes to verse 6. Isaiah 53, verse 6, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, I'm sure Philip explained about the suffering and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the the suffering on the cross for which we put Him there. And the resurrection from the dead that leads to the life that we're called to live. To lead to the life that Jesus wants to show that's revolutionary to us as it changes us. You see, only the angels know how long He wrote on this. Only the angels know this. But we know that the Ethiopian was convinced and absolutely converted at that moment. All of us are called to be in touch with the Spirit and with the Gospel. All of us should be able to explain Christ through the Scriptures. You see, meanwhile, here's the eunuch who is there and he's being convinced to take the very next step, right? Verse 36. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the, the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? Philip said, If you believe with your, all your heart, you may. The Ethiopian answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he gave orders for the 
to stop the chariot. They both, Philip and, then Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. No matter what the search is, the Ethiopian's desire was to be baptized and here God provided the next step for him. Isn't that so like God? Whatever our next step is in our life, he provides the opportunity for us. Just like he did here for this eunuch. And I'm sure that Philip explained the gospel and even the appeal for baptism like Peter did at Pentecost. So for whatever reason, the baptism service looked and and took place in this ancient desert setting while the eunuch's attendants and the caravan sat and watched. What was the eunuch's desire? It's for everyone in his entourage to know that he now follows Jesus Christ. And that's why Philip baptized him. It wasn't that there's this random lake that they, just this little guy in the middle of this chariot was able to do. No, it was to present to everyone who followed him, all his friends, all the people that always surrounded him, they all now knew that he followed Christ. That is a testimony of what we're called to do. You heard the long song, hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Right? This is the picture of what this eunuch was like. No, 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 no. My life is different. My life has been changed, and it's because of Jesus Christ. The eunuch and the people alike understood God's work and his power and were in touch with the gospel in front. The third thing we see here is is to be in touch with people. To be in touch with the people. So we've talked about being in touch with the power of God. We've talked about being in touch with the Spirit and the gospel and the Spirit now in touch with uh, with the people, right? So verse 39 says this. This is the part that always blows us away, right? This is why we we talk about this so often. When he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared in Aostas and traveled about, preaching the gospel in the towns until he reached Caesarea. So here's the result of Philip's ministry, right? So he's, he's, he's shared this ministry in Samaria with joy. He's shared this experience with this Ethiopian, and this man is now rejoicing. You think about a man who's willing to be used and obeying the Lord's leading in his life. We see that clearly through Philip. Everywhere that Philip went, because he was submitted to the will of God, God changed and was willing and desired to use this man and his obedience. Philip desired to, to not be, uh, he it wasn't the one, he didn't want to be missed, he didn't want this to be about him. He wanted just to be used. But this man who once was baptized, again, I, this is the part that just kind of blows you away. It's like as soon as Philip brings him out of the water, the guy's like wiping his brow Who cares? Right? He's about, this is about Jesus. I'm rejoicing because now the Spirit of God is in me. He wasn't like, all right, now you know, I got to make posters. Where did this guy Philip go? No, he's not about that. No, he literally was just rejoicing and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, most of us who are, you know, you like sci fi and things like that, you're just like, all right, so the Bible shares that there is time travel right? It's true, and God can do it. Why doesn't he do it to me? So I don't experience awkward situations, you know? You know, I'm just kidding. But this picture of what's taken place with what God is doing in this man's life, it wasn't presented as anything other than, all right, I got your next place where I want you to go. Because look, how often do we think, oh, well, God took him from this desert, put him in Aostas, and all of a sudden, all these people are starting to get saved until he gets to Caesarea, and then he's sharing there. No matter where Philip went, people followed Christ. Why? Because he was obedient, and he was in touch with the Holy Spirit. 
He was in touch with the gospel, and he was in touch with the people that he came and ministered to. If Philip had not loved the people with Christ's love, he would have not reached across giant barriers to the Samaritans and to the Jews and to this Gentile Ethiopian Philip loved the Jews, Gentiles, Samaritans, blacks, whites, no matter what the, is the difference. He was in touch with the people and genuinely cared about them. All right, there is a huge point. People can see whether you genuinely care about them or if you're just going through the motions. God knows our heart, and whether we believe it or not, people can see to our hearts as well. If we are genuinely impressed by the gospel of Jesus Christ and the changing power of the Holy Spirit in us, we will, and it will be seen in us. If not, then then maybe it's we're not being truly genuine about this faith that we're called to. God's path leads to people. Not judging, lest you or I should be judged, but with care and compassion and consideration. No matter what the cost, what we're called to do is to love people because we ourselves are loved. The book of Acts gives a glimpse of the beginning of Philip's ministry and and gives us a little peek into the very end of his service in Acts chapter 29 we or 21 we see this it it also provides us with a brief look at the end of his life so look here in, in Acts 21 verses 8 and 9 it says leaving the next day we reached Caesarea and stayed at a house of Philip the evangelist one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. We talked about this in our Sunday school class this morning, talking about anxiety. But we talked about with a legacy that we leave behind. The obedience that Philip lived his whole life doing followed to the generations that followed him with his four unmarried daughters who prophesied about the very Christ that changed their father's life and changed their life. Twenty years had passed by, and now we see Philip's ministry had yet to fade. He was a prominent man who was used many, many, in many, many ways and is an incredible example of how we are to be in touch with God in touch with others so that we can be used by him. Look at Psalm chapter 92, verses 12 to 14 says this, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of God. They will, yeah, they will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. What we're called to do is to see this, to bring the touch of God to those around us. We have to do this, and our application is this this morning, is to daily yield to the Spirit's leading. Daily yield to the Spirit's leading. Remembering that He guides us in different ways. It might look different for one than it might look for the other. But the goal is for us just to be sensitive to what that leading is, whether that be an audible voice, whether that be in, in, in through God's people, whether that be even through an angel is what Philip did and saw. Secondly, we're le- to learn and to proclaim the gospel, the great story of God's gracious rescue to repentant sinners like us. With compassion, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ is what we're called to to do and how are we to do it is the third thing is to love people with God's love I think it's the most difficult thing to do on planet earth is to love people with God's love I can love them with my love that's no problem but to love them with God's love that's a little bit harder because that causes patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control which I don't have any of 
but with the Spirit I do. We're called to love people with His love. Remembering our theme this morning is this. The Spirit of God compels us to share with compassion. But finally, brothers and sisters, we can rejoice. We get to participate in God's plan in the lives of other people. We get the privilege to participate in the plan and with God's people. So let's pray together.